uh, from the University of Chicago in 2001, and then was a CAC Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. After that, he went back to Canada and joined the faculty at McGill University. Gill has done a lot of pioneering work on the use of galaxy clusters uh, detected in the Sonia Sadovich effect uh, to constrain cosmological parameters. Um, he has also played important roles in the highly successful South Pole Telescope experiment. And uh, another area of expertise is uh, to use gravitational lensing to study the universe, including the lensing of the cosmic microwave background, and also uh, use lensing to probe the uh, small-scale structures of dark matter halos. Today, uh, he will show us the great results from the South Pole, especially the first ever detection of the BMO pattern of the cosmic microwave background. Let's welcome him. Uh, it's nice to be here. It's my first time in Taiwan. It's, uh, it's a lovely place, and I've been having a lot of fun. So uh, thank you for the invitation. All right, so here's what I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to talk about is the, uh, the cosmic microwave background. And in particular, we're going to talk about temperature and polarization fluctuations. So uh, I'll just give an overview of the cosmic microwave background, sort of what it is and what the fluctuations are, what they look like. I'll quickly show the results about the Sinai Zoldovich effect, uh, just because it's something that is near and dear to my heart, and uh, it's a neat result. Um, and then I'm going to spend the, the rest of the talk talking mainly about the gravitational lensing of the cosmic microwave background. And um, so that's good for things like getting neutrino masses, or at least it will be someday. Um, and then the last thing I'll show is the first detection of what are known as B modes. And so my goal is for you to understand uh, what this means and why it's interesting. And uh, that should take about an hour. So uh, let's get going. So what is the history of the universe? So the universe started as some sort of a, well, we don't know what happened, how it started, but uh, we think there was a period sometime in the early universe when it went through some period of effectively superluminal expansion. Uh, and that's what's known as inflation. And then after that, the universe was extremely hot. And we don't know how hot because we don't know when inflation ended or when it happened. Um, but the universe was extremely hot. It was um, so hot that you would not be able to form any, uh, any uh, nuclei, anything like that. And so eventually we formed uh, deuterium and helium. And so we measure Big Bang nucleosynthesis that happened somewhere around uh, when the universe was about an MeV, that's nuclear energy. And then the universe ever since has just been expanding. And so you take a gas and you expand it and it cools up. So the same thing happens to the cosmic microwave background. As the universe expands, it cools. And eventually, when it got to about 3,000 Kelvin, it became cool enough to form atoms. So above 3,000 Kelvin, uh, the thermal energies of the electrons and the photons were sufficiently um, high that you'd form an atom, and then it would instantly get photoionized. So there were no atoms until about 3,000 Kelvin. And the result of that is that with all these free electrons around, they were, they were um, um, glued by Thomson scattering to the photon. So the net result is that a photon would go, would do some random walk and go some very small distance and slam into an electron and then keep moving around. So basically, before 3,000 Kelvin, the universe was completely opaque to light. So before 300,000 years, the universe was effectively completely opaque. As soon as we form atoms, all the electrons get taken away, which means there's no longer, the photons no longer see anything because they're much less strongly coupled to atoms, to neutral atoms than they are to electrons. And since then, the photons have just been streaming across the universe, roughly unimpeded. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is that, in fact, they're not, they don't go all the way across the universe unimpeded. I'm actually going to show you uh, the impediments that photons have had to experience since coming to us. And, uh, but before we talk about that, let's just talk about um, you know, what happened at, when the universe was 3,000 Um So instantly, what you get is you get this clock. So zero, who knows what happened? So let's start at 10 to the minus 3 or something, because uh, who knows what was before that. Um, but at 300,000 years, there was some magic time in the universe. Something happened at 300,000 years. And we know that that uh, 300,000 years is a time. So you multiply that by C, and that gives you a distance. So there's some horizon at 300,000 years, which is a very special length. And so because the photons were doing a random walk, it turns out that it's not the C, it's instead basically C over root 3 or something. 
thing is the sound speed of the photons at that point. But there's a horizon for photons. So if you see any photon pattern that's coming from this time, this 3000 Kelvin, there's going to be some special scale that's imprinted in it. And this is the, this, the scale that we'll see in the cosmic microwave background in a second. Um, so these photons at, at 300,000 years were about 3,000 Kelvin. Since then, the universe has been expanding. So as the universe expands, the photons keep cooling, keep cooling, keep cooling. And we see these today as a 3 Kelvin background. So there's the 3 Kelvin CMB spectrum. So if you take the, uh, so COBE was a satellite in the, around 1990. Uh, at 53 gigahertz, you take a, a map of the sky. And if you just take that map of the sky and you plot it, it looks like this. It's the least interesting map in the world. Um, but this is actually a map, and it's a, and all you see is a monochrome, which is to say there's a 2.7, so here was 2.728, I think now we think it's 2.725. But um, it's basically a three Kelvin, almost completely isotropic background. When you look at the spectrum of this thing, here's the spectrum, and what do you see? Well, you see that it's an incredibly good, that it's a, it's a black body. So it's a black body spectrum at three Kelvin, um, and importantly, it's extremely smooth. So, and how smooth is it? Well, so if you remove that monopole, which was three Kelvin, so that, that first map was three Kelvin, you subtract that off, um, at a plus or minus three and a half millikay scale is when you see this fluctuation. You can see a little hint of that fluctuation in that first one. At least I can. You can see there's sort of something that's a little funny up there. And what's that? Well, so this is some dipole pattern, and that's coming from our motion relative to the cosmic microwave background. So we are moving through this bath of photons, um, and our velocity is some number of hundreds of kilometers a second, which relative to C is 10 to the minus 3. So you naturally expect some dipole signal that's going to be on the order of 10 to the minus 3 of that monopole. So 10 to the minus 3 of 3 Kelvin is 3, is 3 millikay. So that's the dipole. And you look at this, and you say, well, we must be moving in this direction. So there is actually a preferred rest frame of the universe for doing calculations. The pho this photon bath has sort of given us a natural way to uh, do our calculations. But still, this is remarkably, so this is three and a half millikay, and you subtract that off, and if you subtract, so here it is at three Kelvin, here it is at three and a half millikay, you subtract off this dipole pattern, and you have to do your stretch down to 18 microk to see any fluctuations. So there's this thing right here is our galaxy. So this is a map of the whole sky. For the center of the galaxy is here. You unwrap the whole sky and you plot it here. Um, so this is just our galaxy. And what you're seeing here is a combination of uh, synchrotron radiation from relativistic electrons so around supernova remnants and things like that, um, and uh, dust. So there's all sorts of, uh, I guess if we wanted to get more money, we'd call them nanoparticles. Um, so they're thermally emitting nanoparticles that are uh, spread all through our galaxy. And so they're pretty bright. So you can even see the brightest one, this knot right here is a big knot of uh, some sort of galactic stuff, and as is this. So some of that gets almost up to a millikay. But, so this part here is pretty bright, but these fluctuations up here, plus or minus 18 microk, these are the fluctuations in that cosmic microwave background. So this is telling us the fluctuations in that photon field that's come to us from when the universe was 300,000 years old. So this is just to give you a scale. And so this is extremely smooth. I would challenge anyone to do anything to a precision of 18, uh, 18 micro K relative to three Kelvin. That's an extremely large contrast. And so what this says is that the universe is extremely smooth. And so this was one of the mysteries for a long time in cosmology was why the universe was so smooth. Because um, generally, if you look at anything, it will not be smooth to, set, to a part of it. Um, all right, so COBE happened in the 90s, so 92 is when they released these maps. Um, so the initial discovery of the CMB was 1965. 2003, it was mapped with the WMAP satellite. So there were lots of other people that did chunks of the sky at various levels of resolution, but the next all-sky map was WMAP in 2003, and you can see you went from sort of this resolution to this resolution. And so these fluctuations here, this is basically just a high resolution view of this. Um, and so you can see there's all sorts of fine scale structure. And so what this mapping is actually the ripples um, at redshift of a thousand. So when the universe was a thousand times uh, smaller than it was today, we're actually seeing the fluctuations 
And these fluctuations, um, the fluctuation that was in our neighborhood of the universe is what grew to form our galaxy. So this is, these are the fluctuations of uh, seeded all structure formation. So uh, what was released a few months ago were, were results from the Planck satellite. And so here was WMAP in 2003, here's Planck in 2013, and um, you would look at this and say, well, those don't look very different to me. Why did we launch the Planck satellite? Um, and uh, so the reason for that is because we're looking at some resolution here, and so what's the resolution of a projector? It's some number, it's like a megapixel or something, you know, some 10 to the 6. And it turns out that um, at that resolution on the sky, these things really do look the same. It's just saying that WMAP mapped the whole sky at a resolution that basically covers the projector. Um, and Planck did much better. So to see this, let's zoom in. So here's a zoom in on a 16 degree chunk of the 60 gigahertz WMAP map. And here it is at 143 gigahertz. So this is about two millimeters. Um, and here it is in Planck. And so what do you see? Well, um, so the same structures are here. This piece here is here, and this piece here is here. So all of like the big splotches are there, but you see a lot of smaller scale fluctuations in this Planck map. For instance, there's a little dot, that's actually a galaxy. Um, so it's probably a radio source, it's probably a supermassive black hole that's accreting. And uh, the synchrotron radiation that's coming out from around that is probably what that thing is. And you can just barely see a smudge there. So, here, so basically what's happened is Planck has, much, has substantially higher resolution, and all this crap here is just noise. So it has basically uh, much lower noise and higher resolution. And so that was the improvement. And why does that matter? Well, because we're mapping this photon field that came all the way across the universe just to get to us, so we should measure all its fluctuations. This is telling us what the universe looked like at a redshift of 1,000, so we, sh we should measure it. So this is what the Planck satellite did. What I'm going to talk about today are mainly things that we've done with the South Pole Telescope. So the South Pole Telescope is a 10 meter, millimeter wave dish at the South Pole. So um, it observes at three different wavelengths, or so at frequencies of 90, 150, and 220 gigahertz. So it's down in, in a sort of millimeter wave, roughly. Uh, and here is the telescope. So that's the moon behind it. And here's another picture with the Milky Way behind it. So it's just a big telescope sitting at the South Pole. Uh, there and uh, so these were pictures taken by our winter overs. So there's two people every year that sit down there and um, and look after our telescope for us while it's taking all the data. Um, and you might say, why would you go to the South Pole to do something like this? It sounds like a crazy place to go. Um, so it is a long way away, um, but there are many advantages to it. So uh, it's extremely dry, and when you're observing in the millimeter, uh, water is your enemy. So you think about how your microwave oven works. Well, your microwave oven works by coupling to water, and so if you are doing a microwave background experiment, you really don't like water. Um, it's very stable, so the sun comes up once a year and it goes down once a year, which means your telescope will warm up once a year roughly and then it'll cool down once a year. Um, and that's extremely handy. Uh, so if someone is not at the South Pole or at the North Pole, if someone's at some mid-latitude, you have these uh, daily fluctuations. and. Uh, so imagine a 10 meter telescope being differentially heated and the whole thing will flex and so you'll have problems that your beams will change. Um, so it's just, it's very nice to be very stable. And the stability actually goes into the atmosphere as well. The atmosphere has, has uh, tends to have smaller fluctuations. Uh, so the water that is there tends to be much more just sort of a laminar sheet that's going across without a lot of little uh, things in it. And there's also a surprisingly large amount of support down there. There's a big science station that the U.S. runs at the South Pole. So the people here that work on uh, ice cube, that's a neutrino experiment down there. And so there's a, a lots of scientists down there. So it's actually a very nice place to work. So why the, uh, the moon is so fuzzy? It's just supposed to be uh, extremely dry and should be clear. Uh, it could be scattering off of ice, cr ice crystals. So it's, it's <coughs> like uh, ice crystals floating in the air? There would be ice crystals in the air. So ice crystals? No, that doesn't matter for your observation? Uh, it, no. We haven't, we see no problem with it. So there's, there are some concerns that it might end up someday being measurable in polarization, but uh, we've seen no evidence of it. So it's a large collaboration, so, our, well, okay, it depends on how you define large. So, um, 
So the main institutions are Chicago and Berkeley. So Chicago is where the, the main PI is. Uh, there's a big group in Berkeley. Uh, McGill actually has is probably the third biggest node of this. So where we are in Canada, we probably have about uh, maybe eight or nine people working on it there. So the collaboration as a whole is probably somewhere between 40 and 100, depending on how you uh, add these things up. Um, and it's the whole thing is funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. So um, as Canadians working on it, it's a little bit funny because we. <laughs> Obviously, we don't get any money from the NSF. All money reflects at the border. <laughs> um, so uh, how do we do the measurements? Um, so there's a camera. So when you, at some point, you have to detect your photons. So the way the photons are detected is with the bolometer arrays. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about was done in between 2007 and 2011 with 960 detectors. So each of these little things is a is a wedge full of detectors, so there are 960 bolometers in here. Um, so what we recently completed was an upgrade. So these were only sensitive to temperature fluctuations, which is to say intensity fluctuations. We measure the photon field and measure the photon intensity. Um, so we did that pretty well. Um, and now we've moved on to not just measuring the temperature fluctuations or the intensity, but also measuring the polarization of the light. So it turns out that the cosmic microwave background is extremely polarized. Uh, what we're moving towards is the next generation, which should go on in 2016. We're going to go from 1,600 to 960 to about 1,600. We're going to go up to about 15,000 detectors in a few years. And what this 15,000 detectors is going to let us do is uh, just become much, much, much faster. So we should be able to do at least an order of magnitude better with this array than we did with this array. So that will be in a few years. So what is 3G? No, we're just trying to get a name. It's third generation. It's a third generation camera. But if anyone has a better idea for a name, everyone hates the name. It's like, why don't we call it Edge or something? It's crazy. Um, so why would we do this? So we are, I showed you that Planck map, and that Planck map looked like it's all you need. Um, so here's the Planck map, and now I've zoomed into four degrees. So remember, the first map I showed you was W map versus Planck, all sky. And then I zoomed in on 16 degrees, and you saw the plank was a lot better. Um, so here's a chunk that's four degrees on the side. And here's the plank map. And then when you add in the SPT data, uh, it's the left versus right. And so you see that the fluctuations are still, this, the large scale splotchiness is the large scale splotchiness. But now you can see the noise in this plank map. And you can see the difference that resolution makes. So now you see a lot more of these galaxies that are basically invisible. <laughs> So you really don't see all of these galaxies in this map on the left. Um, and you can see a lot more structure in this diffuse stuff. You can see these little wisps coming along here, and here you just sort of see a fuzzy blob. So, um, so it's just sort of the natural progression of we want to get to higher and higher sensitivity, and to do that, you, uh, higher and higher resolution, which means you need more sensitivity. Uh, however, uh, this was over the whole sky. So this is a four degree zoom in. Um, with SPT, we can't do the whole sky, even if we wanted to, or fixed on the ground in one spot. But um, so we've done about 2,500 square degrees, which turns out to be about 8% uh, of the sky. So these circles are very early galaxies. You know what? They're actually mostly uninteresting galaxies, just all over the place. There's there um, a lot of these are basically you consider these to be foreground objects. So we just look out of the sky and we see everything that's there, and, and, and they'll be um, like any other galaxy. Any, any, if you imagine any map of the universe that you've seen done in the optical, you see all these dots. These are those dots. And the reason they show up in our, you only see a few of them, because, so most of these are actually radio sources, maybe about two thirds of them are radio emitters, and you only get a radio emit emitter if you have a black hole that's doing a little bit of accretion. Um, and not all galaxies are going through a phase where they're radio bright. So only a few, maybe a 1% of galaxies or something like that are radio bright. Um, but some of them could be quite close. Right? Some of them are quite close, yeah. Like, uh, and uh, so not in this map, but actually um, some of our maps have a few stars in them. So uh, we actually have uh, one of these dots, and I, it's, not one of, it's not literally one of these dots, but a dot like this is actually Beta Pictoris, which is a debris disk that has a filament around it. Um, and you can actually see the disk that it's embedded in. Like anything you need to read. Um, but you can also see one of the advantages of going to high resolution is that in this map, you can't see this dot. 
which means when they look at this patch of sky, they don't realize that there's one of these galaxies in it. So when they're trying to figure out what the universe looks like um, at 300,000 years old, um, they're going to be a little bit off because this dot is corrupting their math. So you need this, these high resolution experiments in order to understand exactly how bright the galaxy foregrounds are. Okay, so what do you do with maps like this? Well, um, so in general, you look at this thing and it just looks like a random blotchy field. And it turns out it's actually a formally random <laughs> blotchy field. It's a Gaussian, for all the world that we can tell, it's actually a completely Gaussian random field, which is to say if you um, take different spots and you histogram up uh, what the pixel values are, it's just going to be a Gaussian. And it doesn't matter how you filter your map, it'll always, if you histogram up your pixels, it's going to look like a, just a regular normal distribution. And the variance will change as you bend it on different scales. Um, but in, for all the world, you can't actually see anything interesting in here except there's a bunch of splotches. However, the splotchiness is different on different scales. So, and so the way to see that is to look at the angular power spectrum. So this is just the spherical harmonic transform of this microwave sky. Uh, so you've probably done this in quantum mechanics, but you probably stopped at something like L of 3. So we didn't stop at L of 3, we go out to 3000. Um, so this is, these are just the, um, the variance of the ALMs, so just like you did in quantum mechanics when you uh, calculated wave functions, except now we're going all the way up to L of 3000. And why do we use this? Well, because that's the natural basis for the sphere. If you want to expand the sphere in some basis, the natural thing to use are spherical harmonics in the same way that if you had some periodic grid, you would use Fourier coefficients. Here we're using spherical harmonics. They're effectively the same thing. And actually in the azimuthal direction, so as you go around the sphere, um, it is exactly equivalent <coughs> to a Fourier expansion. It's an e to the i m phi, and phi is the angle in one direction. So, so what you can think of this is scale. So as you go to high L, that's small scale. Down here corresponds to, to something like a degree, maybe half a degree, depending on how you, you look at it. And so what this is saying is that the angular power spectrum of the sky, so first of all, it's not zero, which is to say there's all that splotchiness there. Um, and it's also, you see these peaks. And what are these peaks? Well, this peak right here, corresponds to that special scale, which is 300,000 years. And that's the what's known as the acoustic scale in the CMB. And then you see all the harmonics of that. And what you see is that we've now measured this thing, so it's a sort of a funny scale where they jammed everything in here so to emphasize the peak structure. Uh, but what you see is you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then it depends on your religion whether there's nine in there. Um, but you see this series of, of harmonic of harmonics of this fundamental scale, which is the size of the universe when it was 300,000 years old. Um, and so this has some shape to it. It's not, it's not flat, so it doesn't go across with these harmonic peaks. It has some shape to it. And what we can do is use the, sh the details of the structure of the peaks and how this falls off to actually uh, basically uh, probe the early universe. So we're, we can use this, and it's almost like a well, so it, it, through sound, we can actually measure what the universe is made of when it was 300,000 years old. You can measure the sound speed. You can uh, look at all these details of what's going on. And we've done all sorts of things to learn about the early universe that way. But we're not going to talk about the early universe today. We're going to talk about the later universe. And you can see that, so here was WMAP, that sort of splotchy thing. Uh, and you can see that when you get, there's some scale that corresponds to about uh, maybe a quarter of a degree. or where they, their error bars start to blow up. And this is what you saw by eye when those, when I compared Planck with WMAP, was that, um, you know, that on small scales, it just was very noisy. And that's what this error bar is saying, is that eventually it gets noisy. And then you see that uh, with the Planck experiment, that's these red curves, you can see you get all the way out to here, sort of a factor of two better at least, before, again, the error bars start to blow up. And then where these ground-based experiments, like SVT and the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, kick in or out here. So this is the part um, that I was showing you when I was showing you that we were much better than Planck on scales that are down here, which is scales of a two arc. Um, so in general, just to sort of orient you, the resolution of the SVT maps is about your, the resolution of your eye. So if you look at something and what your resolution is, that's roughly the resolution of the SVT maps. 
whereas those W map maps have a resolution that's um, a reasonable fraction of the moon. So that, that's sort of where we're going. All right. So what else do you need to know? Well, the CMB is polarized. So all photons, you know, photons carry it. There's a, you know, there's an intensity and there's a polarization state. And so uh, the CMB is polarized. It's actually quite strongly polarized. It's almost on the order of 10%. And 10% might not sound like a lot of polarization, but um, most astrophysical sources, if they're polarized, are polarized at only a level of a few percent. So 10% is actually quite strongly polarized. Um, so WMAP measures the polarization, and so here you can see what they've drawn here the, is, the, is the orientation of the polarization angle. So these are the, you know, so there's some orientation to the polarization, and so that's what they've measured. And so we'll measure that as well. And in fact, we do measure this. So here is a, a SPT pole map. So this is the second generation camera that we put in. So this is fresh off, uh, this is just from uh, within the last year. And so this is the Stokes Q map. So if, I don't know if you remember your um, polarization, but you, to measure polarization, you have to parameterize it somehow. So what is polarization? Well, it's the orientation of the, let's say, the electric field vector of the photon. And um, so that's going to have some orientation that you need to measure. So it's either going to be this way or this way. So often what you use are the Stokes parameters. So a Stokes, the Stokes Q parameter is measuring how much polarization is in the vertical direction versus the horizontal direction. So things could be either up and down. You could have the electric field tends to go up and down this way, or it could tend to go this way. And so Stokes Q is telling you whether, how much is this way compared to this. Stokes U is tipped over by 45 degrees, whether it's at this way or this way. So it's just, this is the way you parameterize a spin tube field. You need to, so if you want to just throw down some coordinates, uh, you can do that, and polarization is spin two. It's a headless vector, right? There's not a the E field goes up and down, which means it doesn't. This versus this is the same. So this is a map of the cosmic microwave background. So these are just where there's some point sources that we had to mask out because they were sort of getting in the way. Um, and this is a map of the cosmic microwave background. And you might look at this. Well, so I'll let you just look at it for a second and decide what you what you make of it. So just sort of remember what that looks like and just tell me if something looks a little funny. And now I'm going to show you the U map. So remember, this is this way versus this way. And now the U map is measuring 45 degrees. And what's that? Uh, well, so that's another map. But I think what you can see in these maps is that the structure here tends to be along the diagonals. And the structure here tended to be either up and down or side to side. And so what's going on here? It's kind of weird. Because um, remember, I told you the temperature field is just this Gaussian random field. So it's just this mm, splotchiness all over the place. You know, what is it about this? Why is the microwave background have this funny orientation dependence to it? Well, it turns out that um, what, what these are, what are known as E modes and B modes. So what is an E mode? Well, an E mode is where, if this is the polarization direction, so if the polarization is this way, it's one spot in the sky, and somewhere else it's this way, and it's this way, this way. So imagine you have some modulation of the polarization on the sky. So this is the direction of the, of the electric field vector, uh, different spots on the sky. So here it's uh, horizontal, here it's vertical, here it's horizontal, here it's vertical. Um, so it's, you can label this as an E mode, if the direction that the polarization is changing, so this is the polarized intensity is changing, so here's this way, here's this way, here's this way. If that's in the same direction as the orientation of the electric field, that's an emo. So it's changing as you go in this direction, and the orientation of that polarization vector is, either, is always either straight up or horizontal. It's always going, you know, there's a strong symmetry here that where it's changing this way, and the electric field vector is either, always either aligned with this direction or 90 degrees to it. That's what an E mode is. And a B mode is something that is actually changing at 45, the polarization direction is at 45 degrees to the direction it changes. So here you have, it's changing as you move in this direction, but the polarization vectors are tipped at 45 degrees. And so this is just a way you can decompose a spin two field. And what's nice about this is if you work in terms of E modes and B modes, it's uh, coordinate independent.